I apologize if some of the slides aren't exactly as they are in your handouts, but it should be pretty easy to follow regardless. Um, just so you know a little bit about what I'm doing here in South Africa, um, I was here in 2008 working at McCord's Hospital, mostly just doing clinical work, working on the wards, um, and now I'm back working on research projects at McCord's and Princeton Cheney. Um, the McCord's people have probably seen me around, the Princeton Cheney people, we haven't started there yet, so hopefully you will be seeing me. And my work is mostly around what to do with serodiscordant couples who want to have children, how to help them do that as safely as possible. Um, and uh, Brian and I met each other in school last summer in Boston, so it's nice to be working with Brian again as well. Um, so this talk is the basics of HIV resistance and antiretroviral therapy. I read the, the participant list, and I know you all have varying experiences with this, um, but hopefully this will be, make sense for everybody, and please stop and ask questions if anything does not make sense. Um, so I want, to, in the course of probably a little less than an hour, um, I want to go over the HIV life cycle, which you've learned in this course before, um, and what that will help you to do is sort of understand the mechanisms of resistance, because understanding how HIV replicates and makes itself helps us understand where it makes errors and how that affects how our drugs work. Then we'll talk about how resistance develops. We'll talk about why resistance develops, things about the virus that make that happen, things about the drugs, and things about our patients. Um, how you can identify resistance in patients that you're taking care of in the clinics. And then we'll talk a little bit about the initial management of HIV resistance in South Africa. Um, and if anyone's interested, I'm happy to talk about what we do in the United States, but it's a little different just because of um, the drugs that we have available for second line and third line and so on. Are there any questions? There's a lot of chitting, chit chatting. Is, is there anything for me that I can help with? No, okay, people are just getting settled. Um, so you have all seen this before, yes? So this is how HIV works. So this is the HIV virus coming into, this is in the bloodstream, and it enters the cell through receptors at the cell. And then HIV is an RNA virus, and in order to replicate itself, it has to tr be transcribed into DNA. DNA is what's in our cells, and the DNA is inserted into the human cells, and that's how the virus is able to sort of wreak havoc. It replicates itself again and again and again, and then it produces proteins, which get chopped up into smaller proteins, repackaged into new virus, and then out into the bloodstream to infect more cells. So this is how HIV does the, biz the main thing that it does, which is make lots of copies of itself to infect lots of cells. And so reverse transcriptase, then, is an enzyme that is used by HIV to change RNA to DNA. So this is really important. And so we have drugs that work at the reverse transcriptase site. And those are the drugs that we're very familiar with. So efavirenz, good morning, and, and nivirapine are both NRTIs. They're revert, they're, the N is nucleoside, RT, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So they work here. And then AZT, D4T, 3TC, all those other drugs that we use are NRTIs. Um, and they also work at this site. So this is a really important site for our drugs. It's also a really important site for HIV. And so when, they're mis when this enzyme gets messed up, when there are mutations here, then our drugs don't work as well. So that's important to understand. And then the other drugs that we have here in South Africa are protease inhibitors, and they work here. They inhibit this part of the whole cascade of making new viral particles. And so mutations here also affect the ability of our drugs to work effectively. Um, so as the virus is replicating itself again and again and again through this life cycle using reverse transcriptase, <coughs> using protease, um, it makes mistakes. This is what viruses do. They, they make lots of, oops, excuse me, I'm a little excitable. Um, they make lots of copies of themselves. And in the process, they make mistakes. So as it replicates, as it goes through that whole process we just went through, there are little mistakes. And those mistakes are in the viral RNA or the viral DNA, depending on where it happens. And we call those errors mutations. That's what we mean when we say it's a mutation. It's, it's not like the virus started out. It changes just a little bit. And the reason the virus actually wants to do this is because it makes the virus different. And so some of the new strains are going to be weak, and they won't be as good, and they won't replicate as well. But some of the new strains will actually be able to survive in different conditions. So when we give our patients drugs, we create different conditions, and it's in the virus's interest to mutate in order to survive in that sort of a situation. 
So when our drugs are working really well, when our patients take the drugs nicely, they take them every day, they take them at the same time, we actually stop that viral replication. And by stopping the replication, we stop mutations. And so we don't give the virus a chance to make errors, and we don't give the virus a chance to make a, make a virus that's going to do well in the setting of the drugs that are on board. So full suppression, meaning your patient's taking their meds all the time, of the replication means it can't, they can't mutate either. Does that make sense to people? Okay. On the other hand, incomplete suppression, so, and we'll get into all the different ways that we can have incomplete suppression, but what are some, well, well, we'll get to this, but incomplete suppression meaning maybe not taking the drugs at the same time, maybe not taking all of the drugs, maybe taking other drugs so the drug levels are low. Incomplete suppression means that the virus gets to make the mutations and gets to try to get strong in response to the medications. So those are mutations that make the viral stronger. We call that enhancing viral fitness. Viral fitness just means it's strong and it, it, can, it can do more damage. So while having ARVs in place, then the virus can learn how to escape from the ARVs through making mutations. So we say that certain antiretrovirals select for certain mutations because the virus is replicating and replicating, making all these errors. It gets lucky and it makes an error that actually makes it stronger and so it can escape the 3TC or the D4T or the efavirenz, and then that particular mutated virus will continue replicating. So this is, um, this is how Brian likes to describe this, and I think it works really well. So this little blue dot represents the virus that someone gets infected with. And so without any drugs on board, the virus does its job, and it makes lots and lots of copies of itself. So it'll make copies of itself, and oops, here it made a little mistake. And now it's, it's changed. It's slightly different, and we'll see how this one's going to do. Maybe this one makes it stronger, this one, maybe this one makes it weaker, but it will continue to try and replicate itself. And oh, look, there it made another error. So it continues to replicate itself, and without any drugs around, there are random errors that happen, and some of these viruses are going to be stronger than others, and some of them might actually um, be able to resist drugs that we introduce. So now I'm going to, we now have that same population of viruses. So the viruses that result from kind of random mutations without any drugs around, just from the virus replicating itself again and again. And so we introduce a drug. Let's pick a drug. What drug do you want to introduce? Any drug. Doesn't matter. Just pick one. Hmm? Okay, so let's say this is AZT. So we've now introduced AZT, and oh, a lot of those viral particles are killed by the AZT. It can't replicate in the pre presence of the AZT. The AZT's gotten into the reverse transcriptase binding site. It can't make new copies, except a few of these can, can still be produced, even though the AZT's there, because they know where AZT's working, and these guys have mutated so that AZT can't bind to that site, so they can still produce. So if you have one drug on board, the virus can learn how to understand the drug, and it will make mutations that escape from the drug. So now we introduce a second drug. Pick, pick a second drug. We have AZT, so it can't be AZT. Okay, so a Favrin, so now, or a Stockrin. So now we have Stockrin on board, and what's going to happen here? So now the virus has a harder challenge because it has to learn how to escape from the AZT that's acting at one site and the efavirenz or the Stockman that's acting at another site. But it's pretty smart, and so it still, has, it still manages to make one guy who's going to escape, one guy who manages to block all the sites where the efavirenz or where the Stockman and the AZT are trying to get in. And so even with just that one, if there's only these two drugs around, you can still have one virus that escapes, and that guy can continue to reproduce and you'll have resistance, and you'll have a patient with lots of virus running around despite these two drugs. So we don't use two drugs. We use three drugs. So what's the third drug? Lamivudine or 3TC. Great. So now we've got AZT, Stockrin, and 3TC, um, and there's no replication happening at all. So there's, there's no virus being produced. There's no time for random mutations. The virus can't escape because you've just stopped all of the replication. So at this point, we're good. We don't have to worry. Our patient's going to do fine. Now, I have to remind myself how this works. This is Brian's art, artistry. Okay, so let's say, so now they're, we're happy because our patient's taking the AZT, they're taking the 3TC, they're taking the efavirenz, um, they're taking the Stockrin. 
And our third drug was the 3TC. So let's say our patient thinks, well, this 3TC, I'm not so sure it's making me feel so good, and they forget to take it, or they're not taking it regularly, and it goes away. And then suddenly the virus is like, oh, I remember how to escape from these things. I remember what I did when I only had AZT and efavirenz around. I made this purple thing, and that purple thing comes back. And that purple thing is able to reproduce, and the patient becomes viremic. And in the process, there's some random mutations happening along the way that are maybe more resistance. And then the patient, the patient goes to the doctor and say, oh, you're not taking all your meds. Take all your meds again. So they take all their meds again. But now the virus knows how to escape, even when you have all three drugs on board, because it made mutations. It learned how to run away, how to run away. But it learned how to kind of mutate so that none of those drugs could bind, none of those drugs could do their job, and so it can still replicate. And so now you have resistance, and you have this virus that doesn't really care that you have three drugs on board because the ones, the, vir the viral particles that can escape are just going to reproduce. The patient becomes viremic, the patient becomes sick. You have to think about switching their medications. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And we'll have, there's another, um, I have one other example of kind of a way to think about it um, that we'll come to later when we're talking about how to teach patients about this. Um, so one of the things that came up in that example with the dots is that there, there's cross resistance. So lots of the mutations that the um, virus can develop will actually make it resistant to more than one of the drugs that we have. We have classes of drugs. We just talked about AZT, AZT and 3TC. And those are NRTIs, and then also in that family are tenofovir um, and enterocytobine and a bunch of others. Those are all in the same family, and mutations within that family affect other drugs in that family. Similarly, efavirenz and nevirapine are in the same family, and a mutation that affects efavirenz is also going to make the virus resistant to nevirapine. Protease inhibitors like Kaletra or Alluvia um, are also all in the same family, and the, the mutations that, have, that will make uh, the virus resistant to one of those drugs will affect the other drugs, but they're a little more, um, um, those drugs are a little stronger, and so it takes a little more before the virus can get resistant to those. But it's important to know that as you get mutations, um, you can have resistance to more than one ARV at a time. Just switching one of them is maybe not going to be very helpful. Um, and I talked about these other points. And the reason for that goes back to understanding the life cycle. So if the virus mutates itself at the reverse transcriptase site, then it's going to be able to run away or escape or be resistant to the drugs that act at this site. So that's why one, one family of mutations can affect a whole family of drugs. Okay. So I wanted to talk about the life cycle, which we did. Are there any questions about the life cycle stuff? And then we talked about how resistance develops sort of how the virus runs away in response to the drugs that are putting pressure on it to try and escape from those drugs. So now I'm going to talk about why resistance develops, what it is about the virus that can make it happen, what it is about the drugs, and what it is about patients. So in terms of the viral factors for why resistance develops, we talked about this high replication rate. It's reproducing itself again and again and again and again and again. And part of what happens there is there are random errors, there are random mutations that are made. There's lots of mutations made because the virus is, is a pretty good virus, but it still makes a lot of, muta of errors. Um, and those errors are good for the virus in one respect because it adds diversity and allows it to, to survive in different conditions. Um, but the thing is, is that the wild type, or the initial, the, the virus without mutations, is the strongest virus around in the absence of other environmental pressures. But special situations like having drugs on board can give the mutants an advantage. So the virus has an, has an interest in making these mutations, and so we want to just stop all of this replication so that the virus can't make any mutations and make itself kind of smarter. The other thing that I think is a, a slightly more sophisticated piece of this, but something worth keeping in your head, is that if the virus learns how to escape and it, it develops mutants that are resistant to certain medications, 
when those medications go away, that population of mutants is not going to be the biggest population because those mutants in the absence of medication are not the strongest. The wild type becomes the strongest, but it remembers. It remembers how to escape from the virus. That population remains somewhere. There are little reservoirs in the body, like in the brain, where HIV can, can hide out and not be attacked by the immune system. And resistant um, species that are in the body can, can hang out and they can return as soon as you reintroduce that drug. So once someone is resistant to a drug, that drug, drug is, nev is probably never going to work for them again. Even if they are off the drugs for a while, all their wild type virus comes back that doesn't have mutations. Once they go on that drug, the, the um, viruses that start circulating are going to be the ones that know how to escape from the drug. So it's just worth knowing. I think just the point to remember is once you're resistant to a drug, you're always resistant to that drug. You don't get to go back. You don't get to make up for it. Once you've kind of not used your stalker correctly, you don't ever get to go back to stalker. Um, so in terms of drug-related factors to why resistance develops, so we talked about the importance of all of the drugs being on board, all of the drugs being there at the same time in order to have good drug levels to just stop all replication so you don't give the virus a chance to make mutations and learn how to escape from our drugs. So problems with drugs that can happen, so inadequate potency. So the HIV specialists across the world used to think very, very early on that maybe just one drug, when we only had one drug, we just gave people AZT. And people did well on that for a little while, and then their virus came back. And their, virus came, their viral loads came back because they mutated, and they learned to escape from single therapy, from just the AZT. Similarly, when we gave people dual therapy, when we only had two choices, People did well for a little bit longer, but dual therapy wasn't enough. And um, sorry, dual therapy wasn't enough, and the virus learned to escape, and people didn't do well. So inadequate potency of, of drug combinations is one reason that resistance develops. So we all now know that we should give people three drugs, but it's important that we communicate that to our patients because if they don't understand that all of the drugs are important, they might think, well, I don't feel so great on all of them, so maybe I'll just try some of them. So potency is really important. If they don't take all of the drugs, then they can get resistant virus. And then drug levels are really important. So if we as physicians and nurses and counselors and healthcare workers don't give the patients the appropriate dose, um, then they're not going to have high enough levels and their virus is going to learn how to escape. The key is high enough levels so that there is no replication, no chance for mutations to escape. And when did, I don't know, have you guys talked about when this happens, Brian? So what's an example? When, when does this most, most frequently happen? When do, when do doctors and healthcare workers tend to mess up with dosing? Say again? So when you take care of children, how do you dose their medication? Do they all get the same dose? No. How do you dose it? By their weight. Right. And so as they grow, if, if, if no one remembers to look at the weight or to look and see if the medication has been changed because of the weight, then it's not their fault. It's not because they didn't take their meds or no one gave them their meds, but we've been giving them the wrong dose because they grew and we didn't increase the dose for their weight. And so they have inappropriate drug levels and they get resistance and that becomes a problem for their whole lives. Um, so we have to be really careful about that. And there's a couple of drugs with adults that for bigger adults, bigger adults get more D4T, bigger adults get more um, Kaletra. So there's a little bit of changes in the adult population, but it's a much bigger problem with kids because it's, it's bigger changes. Um, the other thing that we as healthcare workers mess up on, not infrequently, is re forgetting about drug interactions. Um, so what have you guys talked, I think this is a talk today, Rifampis, have you guys talked about what rifampicin does to some of the drugs? Okay. So what, what um, rifampicin or rifamycin, what, what is that used, when is that used, who takes that? People with TB. Lots of people have TB and lots of people have HIV. If they're on alluvia as well, alluvia is a protease inhibitor that you use in second line therapy. It's, Kalich, it's also Kalitra, but I think everyone here knows it as Aluvia. Is that right? Um, so it's, it's two drugs. It's ritonavir and it's lopinavir. The point of the ritonavir in that formulation 
is just so that you don't have to take as much lopinavir, because lopinavir makes people very sick. It gives them a lot of nausea and vomiting and kind of GI upset. And so we give them the ritonavir because they don't have to take as much of the lopinavir. And the ritonavir actually works with the liver to block a lot of enzymes that help with metabolism. It blocks enzymes that metabolize rifampicin, and then rifampicin levels go up. And then when rifampicin levels go up, it actually inhibits ritonavir, and it's a whole mess. So the rifampicin levels are too high, the calitra, the alluvia levels are too low, and it's a big mess. So patients who are on rifampicin and on alluvia, you have to be really careful about the dosing. And it's actually pretty complicated and is mostly, I think, dealt with by doctors and specialists. But there's a lot of, there's, rifampicin also affects um, the virapine. And so there's a lot of interactions that we, as healthcare workers, need to make sure um, are sorted out with our patients in terms of their drug dosing and that they're not just taking what we give them and what we counsel to take them and actually getting inappropriate levels because of our failure to check it that, to check that. The other thing then is poor, poor absorption can lead to inadequate drug levels. So if our patients have terrible gastroenteritis, they're probably not absorbing any of their medications and so that can lead to inadequate levels in resistance. And then the thing that we think about a lot is patient adherence to the medications. If they're not adherent, their drug levels won't be adequate and they can develop resistance. And we'll talk a little bit more about adherence later. But I also think it's, it's, it's um, really important for us all to remember the things that we as healthcare workers have a huge responsibility to do besides counseling about adherence, making sure that they have the right dose, they are not on drugs that are going to decrease their levels of drug, and that they're absorbing it correctly. And so just to reemphasize drug levels, the right drug levels are important to control the replication. If you have high drug levels, you can probably prevent development of resistance and certainly delay it. And if you have low drug levels, then the virus gets to mutate and it gets to learn how to escape from the drugs that are on board. And then how does this drug resistance occur? So we've talked about this, but just to reemphasize it, because I think this topic is it's complicated. So you have a lot of viral replication because the drugs aren't around to stop it, to shut it down. And so you get mutations, and then those mutations can cause resistance to the drugs because it learns how to escape. And then we also talked about this already, but it's worth just repeating it. Once the mutation makes HIV resistant to one kind of a drug, it can quickly get mutations to other related drugs. So AZT, tenofovir, 3TC are all very closely related. Resistance in one of those leads to resistance in the others, efavirenz and nivirapine as well. And we talked about this, but to again reemphasize, so the drug levels are very dependent on the dose, on absorption, so DVI is important to take it before you eat, drug-drug interactions. For people who have aberrant liver metabolism or kidney metabolism, that's another issue, um, and then adherence. This usually, the, the issue with hepatic and renal metabolism is usually not to decrease levels, it usually increases levels, so you don't have to worry about that so much when you're thinking about resistance. People who have poor renal function, you have to adjust the dose, like you have to adjust the dose of tenofovir, but you adjust that dose in order to make sure they don't get levels that are too high. So it's usually not a big issue with resistance. Um, and then drugs, there we have drugs that are more um, prone to developing resistance than others. And so certain, there are certain single mutations that can make HIV escape from an entire um, class of drugs. And so efavirenz or stocrin and nivirapine are in the same family. And there's one single mutation called, for those of you who may, these may come up sometime, it's called K103N. There's one single mutation that makes nivirapine and efavirenz not work at all, ever again. Um, and so we talk about efavirenz and nivirapine having a low genetic barrier to the development of resistance. But then there's other drugs that require multiple steps before <coughs> HIV actually becomes resistant. And so PIs, like alluvia, are an example of that. That's part of the reason why we save PIs to use later, because patients who had trouble adhering to their first um, regimen and their second regimen, are going to maybe have problems with their second regimen. So we save PIs for people who are having a hard time because there's a little more forgiveness with PIs. People can miss a little bit more and still do okay with PIs. There's more, um, they're stronger against these mutations. So we'd say they have a high genetic barrier to mutations. Um, I think it's important to know that just to, so that you remember, because you'll hear, you'll hear a lot about how the PIs are very strong, and some people then wonder, well, why don't we use that first? 
Um, but it's really, we try to reserve it for people who are having trouble because if you're having trouble, you're probably going to continue to have trouble and PIs are a little more forgiving for people who aren't so great about taking their medication appropriately. That's not a good thing to tell your patients. Don't tell them <laughs> that <laughs> Alluvia is very forgiving, so you continue to encourage absolute adherence, but you can know in your mind that that's why we save the PIs. Um, and this is just a table that, that replicates what I just told you. These things that have a low barrier to resistance, you only need one mutation. And so NNRTIs, like efavirenz and nevirapine, um, one mutation, and those are, that whole class is lost. And 3TC is actually has a very low barrier as well. And the high barrier are PIs and most of the NRTIs. So one thing that is important just in thinking about how you manage these patients, and we'll come back to this, is that the mutant viruses um, are less strong. So the HIV is interested in mutating in order to escape from our drugs, but it does, there is a cost to the HIV. It's less fit. And so for instance, 3TC, and this, this will be relevant when I talk about how to manage this, but 3TC, there's a signature mutation for that, which is called M184V. It's a lot of letters, but you might hear this. And what happens when the virus has that mutation is it actually can't replicate itself quite as quickly. It can escape from the 3TC, but it actually becomes more susceptible to AZT and tenofovir. So the mutant viruses are a little less strong. They can run away from our medications like it runs away from the 3TC, but it is the, that virus is a little bit more sensitive to AZT and TDF, tenofovir, which affects how we manage these patients. Similarly, for tenofovir, there's a key signature mutation, which is called K95R. The name doesn't matter. But what's important to know is that once that mutation is there, the virus actually is, is weak. It can't replicate quite as well as it did um, as wild type. And it's a little bit more susceptible to AZT. And again, these are just, these are, um, it's a little more detail, but it helps you understand how we manage these patients. In the absence of drug, the wild type virus comes back because it's still the strongest. So what are patient factors that lead to resistance? So we talked about the doctor's responsibility to make sure they're on the right dose, to make sure they're not on drugs that are gonna decrease their drug levels, to make sure they know how to take it. But what are some of the reasons that our patients sometimes mess up and they don't take their, their drugs appropriately? What are some of the reasons that our patients don't take the drugs right? What, what are some of the reasons that patients have a difficult time adhering to their drug regimen? Lifestyle could be a problem. Like, like it's, it doesn't work out well with their life to take medications twice a day at the same time every day. Yeah, so they might not tell their, why is it, why is it hard if they haven't told their family members? You can finish or someone else jumped in with a good answer. Okay. <laughs> because the medication won't be in a place where it will catch the eyes quite often. It will be hidden somewhere and this makes it easy for them to forget. Exactly. They're busy hiding it so they can't put it right by the milk for their tea, for instance, or they can't put it right by where they get water in the morning. So they're hiding it from other people, which means they're hiding it from themselves and it's hard to remember. Exactly. What are other reasons? that people for, don't take their medications right. Say again? Yeah, they're not able to get to the clinic. to pick, Even if their meds are free, they might not be able to pay for the transportation to get to the clinic. Exactly. Yes? Say again? One more time? Yeah, right. So for kids, the caregiver or a very sick adult, the caregiver's changed and the caregiver doesn't understand how it works. Yes. Yes, in the back. Yeah, the medications taste terrible, or they make them feel bad, or they hear from someone else, oh, those medications, they actually make you sicker, you shouldn't take them. The pill hmm? The pill it's hard to take pills. Mm -hmm. Who's had, yeah, I mean, when I have to take medications, it's very hard for me to remember. It's very hard, and I talk about this all the time. It's just, it's plain hard to remember every day, twice a day, for your whole life to take pills. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. They don't understand the importance. They haven't, no one gives them a lecture about resistance. They might not understand. 
And what they understand is that it's difficult, it's expensive, it tastes bad, makes them feel bad maybe at that time. So you all are very familiar with all of these barriers to adherence. And it's really important to help our patients to understand why and to help them make it as easy as possible to remember to take their medication. So they might not understand, they might not tolerate the medications well, they might get unpleasant side effects, it's inconvenient, they might not be taking it appropriately, they might not be taking it at the right time every day, they might miss doses because they can't get to the clinic, they're hiding their meds from people. Major life changes, someone in your family dies, maybe the last thing you're thinking about for that week is to take your medications. Um, sometimes people take drug holidays, they just want a, a break from their meds for a little bit. And then I work mostly with adults, and adults who use alcohol and drugs often will have a hard time remembering to take their medications for all sorts of reasons. So understanding the barriers to adherence, which you all clearly understand well, is really important um, because adherence is so, so, so important to avoiding resistance. So people who take their medications more than 95% of the time have the least likelihood of developing resistance. Their drugs are all there on board, so those little dots can't replicate. They don't have an opportunity to mutate and to get smart and escape from the drugs. There's no chance. If they don't take their medication like at all, or very, very, very infrequently, the virus gets to replicate and make lots and lots of copies of itself and make lots of errors, but it doesn't have an opportunity to get smart in response to the drugs because the drugs aren't around. So people who take their medications like not at all are actually a little protected against getting resistance. It's the people who take it a lot of the time but not all of the time who get into trouble. It's the people who have 70 to 90 percent adherence who have the highest likelihood of getting resistance because they take it for a little bit and there's no replication, then they stop for a little bit, and so the virus gets to make mutations, and then they put the drugs back in their system, and the virus gets to become smart and understand how to escape from those drugs. So the people who take them kind of on and off, or just two, or just one, or, oh, I skipped that one on that day because I'm pretty sure that one makes me have diarrhea, those are the people who get into the most trouble. Um, and so what's, what's, how does this affect how you counsel your patients? How does this fact, the fact that if they take it a lot, they're going to be fine. They're not going to get resistance. If they take it all of the time, or almost all of the time, they're going to be fine. If they take it not at all, they won't develop resistance. But if they're right in the middle, they take it like maybe four times a week, maybe they miss five doses a week, then that's when they're going to get resistant. How does that help you teach your patients about adherence? So what I tell my patients is if, if something is going on in their life that is catastrophic and they just feel like they're going to have a really hard week taking their meds or if they are having terrible, terrible side effects but they're not going to come see the doctor for two months, I don't want them to take their pills like three days of the week and go off of them for four days or to take just the ones that don't seem to have side effects. I want them to take them all of the time but if they feel like they have to stop, I want them to stop all of them. I don't want them to take some of them. I don't want them to take them some of the time. So all or none, nothing in the middle. And I think that is something that we can do to kind of help our patients avoid getting resistance because it's the patients who are having a really, I see a lot of patients like this. They're having a really hard time. They have terrible nausea. They have terrible stomach problems. And, and they're, they're having a difficult time taking their medications. But they want to be good. So they want to try. And so what they end up doing is the worst possible thing. And they get about you know, 70% of the medications in them. With 70% of the medications in their system, it's a perfect storm for the virus to, to understand the drugs and to escape and to become resistant. So all or none, nothing in between. And we can think of it this way. So if they adhere to their heart, to adhere to all of their medications, the virus is suppressed. There's no way it can escape. It can't mutate. That allows their immune system to be strong, and they'll do well. Yeah. Does anyone drive a black Toyota Renek to park in the staff parking lot so you're blocking somebody in the parking lot? No, 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 that's fine. <laughs> um, so if they just take their heart some of the time, 
and they, but they miss several doses every week, or they take weekends off, or they don't take it when they go to their girlfriend's house, or they don't take it when they go when their auntie's in the house. So some of the time, they're trying, but there are certain things that are affecting their ability to take it all of the time. So moderate adherence means they don't have good suppression of the virus, and there's some drug around, so the virus gets to get smart to those drugs. So they get resistance, and then what happens? Then the virus is back, and when they come see the doctor or the healthcare worker and they have their viral load checked and it's up, we don't have good options for future treatment. We don't have a lot of options for second line and third line and fourth line therapy. So moderate adherence is kind of the worst thing they can do. And I think that that's very hard to communicate to our patients because there are lots of other medications that if you take it some of the time, that's pretty good. But antiretrovirals are different. If you take some of them, it's terrible. You need to take all of them. If you can't do all of them, then wait and figure out how to sort out your life so that you can take all of them. And that's part of what you all do when you're training patients is, is making sure that they're ready. So poor adherence is also not so great. There's no viral suppression, and so there's the immune system becomes weak. But you don't have resistance, and so you do have good options for treatment in the future if they make it, if they make it to future treatment. But the, if they're not gonna take it at all, at least you have options for future treatment. It's the people who take it some of the time that get into the most trouble with resistance. So this is how I like to talk to patients about um, resistance, is I think of pills as being like this big, strong thing like an elephant, although this elephant's kind of cute, but I think of like a big, like strong elephant, like an angry bull male elephant, who's sitting on top of a box in the body, and in that box are all the little viral particles. And so as long as the elephant is sitting on top of the box, they're taking their ARVs every day, nothing can get out. All of the virus that's in the system is contained. It doesn't get to mutate. It doesn't get to know this elephant and know how to escape from him or learn what his weak points are. It's stuck in the box and nothing can happen. But if the elephant goes away, because it's like the weekend and it's inconvenient to take medication, so the elephant's off doing something else, the box is now open, and so the little viral particles get to pop out of the box, and they get to run around and replicate and make mutations. Now, if the elephant never comes back, these, mutation, these viruses are not, never going to get to know the elephant, so it's not, they're not going to get resistant, but they're going to have virus running around in their body. But if the elephant now comes back because the weekend is over and, okay, now I can take my medications again, or I got money, I got to go to clinic, and now I have my medications again, the elephant comes back. But these viruses already escaped. They're outside of the box. So the elephant's now controlling everything in this box. But these viruses out here get to continue replicating, and they get to understand this elephant, and they get to make more copies. So this yellow one actually understood how to run away from the elephant. So you get more and more copies of that, and then you're resistant, and you no longer can use this guy is your treatment. You have to change your treatment. So I like to, th so if you take the ARVs every day, the box stays closed, nothing can replicate, nothing can learn how to understand the drugs. If the ARVs are on some days and off other days, that's the perfect storm for getting resistance. Um, do, do you guys have other, do you have other ways that you, do you have other funny little things like that that you use to teach patients about the importance of taking medicines every day? No. It also works to just tell people to take medicines every day, but it's sometimes helpful to have kind of an image of why they're doing it. Um, I happen to kind of like elephants, so I think that one for me works. But um, it's probably worth, as you, as you work more and more with patients, it's probably worth thinking of something that you think makes sense to you that's easy to explain and it's easy for patients to understand. I know Brian has... <laughs> Do you want to explain your, your fire? Yeah. Huh? The, I like it, but it's, the, it's like the boiling water cauldron, the pot. But they all know that already? OK. All right. So there's also the pot. So, so we've now covered what resistance is, how it develops, why it develops, what, the vi what it is about the virus that allows for it to happen, and what it is about the drugs, and what it is about our patients. And so the other thing that's important is knowing how to identify resistance and how to differentiate resistance from some other things um, that can also cause problems. So we think about resistance as people who have a viral load that is no longer suppressed. So depending on what, 
lab you're using, usually around here, it's people that have more than 400 copies of virus running around in their system. And that's either after they initially suppressed, so after they initially were really great with their meds and they got down to less than 400, or people who've been on therapy for six months and their virus load is still high, you need to worry about resistance in them. And so the first thing you need to do is talk to them and try to figure out what's going on. And usually we jump right to adherence, but I want to encourage you to, before you jump to adherence, which, which you will get to eventually, just make sure that it seems like they're absorbing the drugs. So are they having a lot of problems with diarrhea? Are they having a lot of problems with nausea and vomiting? Or are they throwing up the pills? Make sure the dosing is right. Make sure somebody didn't forget to recalculate for that kid that has gained 10 kilos. Um, look at their other medications. Make sure there aren't any interactions. Make sure they're not, if they're on TB medications, you need to worry about interactions. And then you get to talk to them about adherence. And the thing is that you all know as counselors is that patients really like to please us. They want to tell us what we want to hear. We all like to tell people what they want to hear. So they're going to tell, they're, a lot of the times, even if they're not taking their medications every day, they're going to tell you they're taking their medications every day. So counsel them about adherence, even if they say, even if you're pretty convinced they're taking it, just re-counsel them. Remind them why it's important. Talk about the elephant or talk about the boiling pot of water or whatever you use to talk about the importance of taking medications every day. And the other thing, just to make sure you're not dealing with is if the viral load is, is more than 400, but it's still pretty low, it's less than 1,000, it could just be sort of random error in the lab. So make sure that that's not the situation. And the way you're going to do it is you're going to recheck. Anyone who has one viral load that's high, you're going to check it again. But before that result comes back, you're going to go ahead and do all these things and see if you can help identify what the problem is. So if it's more than 400, you're going to think about all these different causes. You're definitely going to do counseling. And the South African guidelines are that in three months, you recheck. In other places, they might encourage checking sooner. But here, the guidelines are to repeat in three months. And now that you're using a lot of tenofovir, it's important to check in, uh, to see what their hepatitis B status is. Because if they're on tenofovir and you suspect resistance, soon you're going to be thinking about taking off the tenofovir. And if you take the tenofovir off and they're hepatitis B infected, they can develop fatal liver failure because their hepatitis B is going to take off. So it's important before you start thinking about any medications to check the hepatitis B antibodies so you know what to do with that tenofovir. I think that's really only relevant for um, doctors and nurses in the audience, not so much for counselors, but it's just a good thing to know. As, as tenofovir is new here, this is not yet in people's consciousness. is an important thing, but it's important. So if the repeat viral load is still high, think again about the causes, because you really want to know what's going on, more adherence counseling, and consider changing the regimen. Um, I'm going to say this here, and then I'm going to emphasize it again. Changing the regimen when someone might be resistant is important, because the longer they stay on that regimen, the more mutations they can get, and the smarter their virus gets, and they can get into more trouble. So there's, on the one hand, there's an impetus to try and change the regimen sooner rather than later, so that you have more chance with the new drugs. At the same time, though, if the reason that they're failing is because they haven't disclosed to their partner and they can't take their meds in front of their partner, you don't want to put them on new meds until that problem is addressed because you don't want them to fail their next regimen. Because if they fail regimen two, then they're in big trouble here because they don't have a lot of other options. So changing the regimen is important to do early, but you don't want to do it if it's not going to be successful. And we'll talk about that again. It's worth re telling you all that there, is, there are options for resistance testing. When someone is on a fail, when you think someone's on a failing regimen, you can do a very, very expensive blood test. And there will be an analysis of the virus and it will tell you where there are mutations in the virus. And understanding what mutations are in the virus helps you to get a sense of what drugs are most likely to work. And it's something that we do sometimes um, here if the patient's failing on second line therapy. So you're trying to figure out what, what next. And after consulting with a specialist, you might do it. And it has to be while the patient's still taking the medication. And it has, they have to have a very high viral load um, and it's worth telling you about it just because we, do, we definitely do it a lot in the states where we like to spend money. Um, we don't do it as much here, but it is done sometimes. Um, but it's important. It doesn't, it's, not, you, this isn't, it's not easy. People, I think people who don't do a lot of resistance testing think that, oh, that must be very easy. It just tells you what drugs work. But it's, it's not that easy. 
Um, it gives you a sense of what might work, and it's very expensive. So it's not something that we encourage for everybody, but it's something that you might hear about. So that, that's what resistance testing is. You get a big printout with all these letters and numbers, and you match those up with what mutations are known and what mutations are unknown, and you can get a sense of what drugs might work. It's 8,000 8, rand is what Brian quoted here. So it's a lot. You can do a lot of good for a lot of other people with that money. So it's, it's not something we do very often for obvious reasons. So when you suspect resistance, you don't get to prove it because we don't do this blood test very much, but when you suspect it, it's really important to identify the causes. You have to understand the causes before you switch because if you switch the patient and they still have the same problem that led to poor adherence in the first place or poor drug levels in the first place, it's, it's not doing them any good. So you don't switch until whatever those problems are have been addressed. Um, and again, as I told you, the other piece of that is don't keep them on a failing regimen for too long because they'll accumulate mutations. And so this is, this is a balance. This is where the art of taking care of patients comes into play. And then again, if they're on tenofovir, make sure you check that, make sure you know their hepatitis B status because it will affect what you do. Um, and just reminding us, we talked about all these things, the factors leading to resistance that we have to worry about. The virus things, we can't really change in our patients, but in terms of their adherence and absorption, in terms of inadequate potency, drug drug interactions, and poor tolerability, these are the things we can address before we change their therapy. So the, um, the new guidelines talk about this a little bit, how to, what to do if you suspect resistance. So if they're on to a tenofovir-based regimen and they're resistant, you can change them to AZT. Remember a while ago I was telling you about how when the virus mutates to escape from one drug, sometimes it's actually a little more sensitive to another drug? So the classic tenofovir mutation actually makes you more sensitive to AZT. That's why AZT is, is also now sort of being reserved for second line therapy is because most, if someone fails on tenofovir or D4T, they're actually, they're usually gonna be pretty sensitive to AZT. So change them to an AZT based regimen. But if, they're, if they have hepatitis B, you actually have to continue the tenofovir and add the AZT. The tenofovir has to stay on because if the tenofovir goes away, their hepatitis B can flare and it can be very dangerous. If they're on AZT already, then you change them to tenofovir. Um, and if they're on a D4T-based regimen, the, the recommendations currently say tenofovir, change them to tenofovir. Another option would be to change them to AZT. And then finally, if they've been on 3TC, you just continue the 3TC. And again, the continuing the 3TC is because of this weird thing that happens, which is that when you have it, the mutation to 3TC, the virus also gets, actually gets a little bit weaker. Not weak enough to protect you from your HIV forever, but it gets a little bit weaker so that the drugs that you do have left work a little better. So you usually continue the 3TC of <coughs> lumibutene. Now again, that's, that's also sort of a judgment call. If they're having a hard time because of pill burden, you might not want to keep on extra pills that are just, that are doing a little bit of good, but maybe not a lot of good. So, Managing resistance is a little bit tricky and usually um, results in some sort of a referral, but th these are the, those are the basics for what to do with the NRTIs. If they've been on a Favrins or Nevirapine, those are no longer going to work. Remember we talked about these guys have a very low barrier to resistance. One mutation in that whole family is out. So if they've been on a Favrins, you don't get to switch to Nevirapine. If they've been on Nevirapine, you don't get to switch to, to Favrins. Usually the change is to Alluvia, which is Kalitra or boosted Lopinavir. And then if they're failing a PI-based therapy, if they're failing on Alluvia, they need to go to a specialist because we have to motivate for some sort of what we call salvage therapy, um, which is hard to do here, but it's, it can be done. Um, in salvage therapies, tend to, so the drugs that we most use here are reverse trans, or the different kinds of things that inhibit the reverse transcriptase enzymes, so the NRTIs and the NNRTI, so Favrin, Nivirapine, Tenofovir, AZT, D4T, DVI, 3TC, those guys all work here. And then we have protease inhibitors, which is alluvia. And so when you have to motivate for salvage therapy, you're motivating for newer protease inhibitors that are a little stronger than alluvia. And then um, not so much here, but in the US, people who go on salvage therapy, there's things that work at this site and there's things that work at the binding site. Um, and there's, well, that's it for that picture. Um, that is a repeat slide. So how do we prevent all of this? 
How do we, so this dealing with resistance is a big pain. It's difficult, it's challenging, it's hard for the healthcare worker, it's hard for the system because it's expensive, it's hard for the patient because they have to take sometimes less easy regimens. Um, it's expensive. So how do, how do we prevent it? What are our responsibilities as healthcare workers? What are some ways to just prevent all of this resistance business? You need to know about it, but how can you prevent it? What are things we can do? Educate patients, right. So educating them, the importance of taking their medications all of the time. Excellent. And telling us that they have trouble with their medications, telling us early. What else? What else can we do? Hmm? One more time? Yes, so making sure, so they might tell us that they're, yes, I'm taking my pills every day. But they want us to be happy, so they're not always telling the truth or they don't know. They, sometimes you think you take your pills every day, but if you don't have a system, you forget. So counting pills to help them know how good they're being. They might think they're being good, we might have to remind them. Perfect. What else? These are all things we talked about. This is review. It's nothing new. So what about the kids? What do we have to make sure about with the kids? Yeah, so giving them support, supporting their caregivers. Also making sure that we as healthcare workers are actually giving them the right dose of medication. That they haven't, that they're not on the wrong dose because they grew. And then patients who are on TB therapy, we have to make sure that their, their medications aren't interacting with the rifamycin in their TB meds. And patients who have lots of other illnesses and are on lots of other medications, just making sure that there aren't drug-drug interactions that are decreasing the effectiveness of the pills that they are taking. So educating patients educating caregivers and supporters, encouraging them to disclose so that they don't have to hide their pills, because we all know that hiding pills makes it difficult for people to remember. And again, we shouldn't be starting ARVs until the patient's ready. Sometimes when patients are very sick, we're very eager to start because we know it's life-saving therapy, but if they're not ready, we need to get them ready. Um, and each visit, I think sometimes we get comfortable with the patients who are doing well and we forget to ask about these things. Asking every time about whether they're adhering to their medication, if they're having any problems, if they're having GI upset that might be inhibiting absorption. Make sure it's dosed appropriately and looking for drug-drug interactions. And then the patient has responsibilities, um, which are to understand what's going on and try to ask us questions. So we need to encourage them to ask their questions. Making sure they're taking their drugs reliably. Um, help making sure that they report their problems, um, and that's it. So I think the, the best thing, it's good to know about resistance because it's important, but the best thing is to know how to try and prevent resistance mutations by encouraging our patients to, to be open about what's going on with taking their medications. So key points, antiretroviral resistance is an important cause of treatment failure, and it's because of unsuppressed viral replication. If all of the meds are on board at the right dose all of the time, then there won't be resistance. The things that are our responsibility, like dosing, drug-drug interactions, absorption, um, are really important to pay attention to. And then adherence, our, our job at teaching people about adherence is important. So all of these problems are, are preventable, but they might have to be addressed often and early. Um, continuing a failing regimen can lead to more mutations. It's a cumulative thing. But changing to second-line therapy before the problem is addressed is also not recommended, so that is a balance. Um, and that is it. So does anyone have any questions about what we talked about or about anything in the notes or anything? <coughs> yeah. So if she stops entirely, if she stops entirely, then her virus will replicate, 
and it will have random mutations, but it, the drugs aren't around for it to get smart. So she shouldn't get resistance to her old regimen. Her old regimen is gone, so she won't be resistant to her old regimen. So if, she, if, if the patient is having a hard time and they stop entirely, they're less likely to get in trouble with resistance. So she There are good options for future management. She falls into this group. So she's poor adherence. She's not taking it at all. So that means her virus isn't suppressed. So that's not really a good thing. Her virus isn't suppressed, so her virus is running around, infecting her CD4 cells, dropping her immune system. But there isn't any resistance developing because she's just not taking anything. The people who take nothing aren't going to get resistance. Yeah, it was in her system, but now it's gone. Um, so her immune system is going to be weakened, and she can get sick, but she does have good options for future treatment. When she eventually goes to the doctor, they can figure out what are some good treatments that are not going to be as bad for the lipodystrophy and the lipoatrophy, because there are better options. If she, for instance, has been on D4T, tenofovir does not have those problems it's anywhere near the degree that D4T did. So tenofovir is a great option. AZT is also a pretty good option for avoiding the problems with lipodystrophy. Other questions? You had one. How, how do you give Bactrim? How, so, sorry, say again? Oh, this person, this example, um, depending on what her CD4 count is. She needs Bactrim if her CD4 counts less than 200. Um, if it's above 200, it's, she doesn't necessarily need it. But it certainly isn't calling, causing the lipodystrophy or the lipoatrophy. <coughs> Any other? Yeah? Right, right. So remind me your name. I've met you before. Yeah, what, say again? Uh, What's your name again? Pumi. Pumi. So Pumi asked a good question. She said that in, in the clinic at McCord's, they've been seeing a lot of lactic acidosis, which is often the result of D4T. So when patients are sick on lactic acidosis, you have to take away the ARVs because the ARVs in that case actually are making them sick. The D4T is making them sick. And she's wondering when that happens, aren't we increasing the risk of them getting resistant? So this case of lactic acidosis stopping all of the medications and waiting until the patient is better before starting new medications is sort of similar to the, the patient who stops because she has lipodystrophy. You're stopping everything. So if you stop everything, the virus gets to continue replicating and it gets to make random mutations, but it doesn't get to get smart to the drugs because the drugs aren't around. If you stop everything, then it's fine. And you'll notice that your clinicians, they don't stop just the D4T, which is the problem. They stop everything because you have to stop everything Thing in order to decrease the risk of getting resistance to those drugs. So her, so the patient who's, who's off the medications because of the lactic acidosis, yes, her virus gets to replicate and it gets to make sort of the random mutations, but it doesn't have the opportunity to, the opportunity to get smart to the drugs. So like as she said, the slide, you know, the people who take their medicines all the time, over 95% of the time, their chance of getting resistance is very, very low. The same is also true about those patients who don't take the medicine at all. If you're not taking the medicine, you're not going to get resistant. Will you still get sick eventually? Yes, you will. It's the longer time that this patient who, because of lipodystrophy, stopped the treatment, the virus is going to make more of itself and more and more and more. And that's going to affect the CD4 cells and they're going to die and then you can get sick. But it's not going to make resistance. The same is true about somebody who we stop for lactic acidosis. Now, in that time, we usually only stop for a short period of time. Sometimes it's a few weeks. Some people, it takes a few months for their lactic to come back down. But in that time, they're not going to usually get too sick, and their chance of getting resistance is minimal because they're not taking any treatment. It's those people that take their treatment most of the time that get resistance. 
So they take it like 80% of the time, or 85% of the time. They miss like two doses a week. Well, that's the highest risk of getting resistance. Because there's still, a sh like the elephant, it came off the box. And so there's virus floating around. And then the elephant comes back on the box. So the virus sees the elephant and can figure out how to get around it, how to yeah. figure out its secret. And I think that's, I think we teach our patients about the importance of taking it all of the time. But I don't think we always do such a good job of saying, of explaining that some of the time is terrible. And I think, I think part of our counseling up front should be mm -hmm. to patients, you know, some of the time is the worst thing you can do. All or nothing for resistance is, is, is the safest thing. So a lot of people, and I, I know even some of my counselors, you know, a patient comes in, their pill count, you know, they missed about three or four doses. You know, and they say, oh, that's fine. You know, you only missed a few. And then somebody comes in and they stop their treatment altogether. Well, they yell at the person who stopped their treatment altogether much more than the person who missed like four or five doses. But the person with the higher risk of resistance is actually the person who missed four or five doses. Because the virus is around, it's starting to wake up, it's getting making more of a time, and then the medicine comes and goes, it comes and goes, and it can figure out the secret. Whereas the person who's just not taking their medicine at all, well, of course that person could get sick, but the chance of getting resistance is actually low. So if you don't want to take the medicine, it's better to just stop it off than to just take it now and then, and take it today, not take it tomorrow, take it on Thursday, skip the weekend. That gives you the highest chance. And like the patients who get something happens and they only have their 3TC and their AZT left, but they're out of their Stockrin, so they think the right thing to do is, oh, well, I'll take those. I'll take the, the ones I have, because they're trying to be good, but that also, that's the worst thing to do, right? So partial is much worse than nothing with HIV. And again, I think that's hard for patients, because that's very different than almost any other problem that you can have in medicine when you use drugs to treat it. Again, it's something that we see commonly in pediatrics because adults they get the tablets and they get it counted out very properly. But lots of times the children get syrups and they finish sometimes before the month is up. The pharmacy hasn't given them, especially if it's still or the police drug. If you've ever tried to measure it out, it's a thick syrupy thing and it has to be small amounts. So if you spill a little bit of that, that's you know could be a day or two of treatment, and they can finish the calitra well before they finish the other medicine. We see it all the time. So what most people do is the collegiate finishes, and they say, oh, well, it's finished. I'll continue my D4T, I'll continue my D4T. And then a week goes by, and so they go to the clinic, and the collegiate has been finished for a week. They've been taking D4T and taking D4T. So then their chance of developing resistance to those is very, very high. So you need to counsel patients. But whenever I start a patient on the treatment, particularly children, Starting syrups like bleacher and lavidine, you have to tell them if it's finished, don't continue all the other medicines. You can come to the clinic right away. Don't wait until the clinic day. You know, if the clinic appointment is a week away, don't wait. You must come right away and collect the medicine. Get the bottle. The pharmacy would be glad to give you a fresh bottle. If it's um, don't continue everything else and only two drugs. That gives you a very high chance. So, yeah, because of the syrup, I don't know if you've seen it, it comes in a very small bottle. Uh, it comes in, I think, a 60 milliliter bottle for the month. So, most patients, a small child, um, I say a child less than about two years of age, based on their weight, they only take about two milliliters twice a day. So, that exactly gives you 60 milliliters. So, if they didn't spill a drop, then it's perfect, right? But if, of course, when you're doing it and it spills, you pull up extra and it, it spills. The thick syrup is disgusting. And some of it always spills and runs down the side of the thing. So you lose, let's say, five milliliters. Well, five milliliters for this child is a day and a half worth of treatment. So that's going to finish her. And other times, while well, the pharmacy says, well, well you know, the child takes two and a half milliliters twice a day. They give them only one sixty milliliter bottle. Well, that's not going to last. So they, they don't.
don't, you know, the pharmacy doesn't calculate in their head and no, actually, this job is too long. Okay, they need a little bit more than one bottle, which is common. And a lot of times the pharmacy doesn't want to give a whole bottle extra because they only need an extra five or ten milliliters. But they need that extra five or ten milliliters. So, gonna, so you need to give them that extra full bottle. And a lot of times 